It's time for Focus on the State Capitol, hosted by Fred Dicker. Fred has been hosting a daily radio program focused on state issues for more than 20 years and brings his knowledge, professionalism, and skilled insight to each program. Now, Focus on the State Capitol with Fred Dicker on Talk 1300. And remember, quote, No man's life, liberty, or property are safe while the legislature is in session, close quote. Welcome to Focus on the State Capitol. The legislature is due to return to Albany tomorrow, and that's that classic court decision I've talked about before, and it's well known by a lot of people at the Capitol. It was even put on some plaques distributed at one time, little um, uh, tile plaques that I had in my office at the Capitol. I still have it now at home. It was from a court decision in 1866, and the observation about the New York State legislature, nobody being safe when they're around, is probably more true today than it was back then. The New York Times today notes that um, Cuomo, Governor Cuomo is uh, seeking to link extension of uh, the uh, mayoral control of New York City schools that purportedly tomorrow's session is going to be about to more pension sweeteners for the downstate unions, some of which are very close to the Senate Republicans. It's a kind of reward maybe for the Republicans in the Senate, so-called Republicans, abandoning their commitment to do something to help out the charter schools down there. Uh, they get a lot of money from charter school backers, but they're also supported by the police and firefighters unions that may benefit from the pension sweeteners. They're always ready in the Senate, as they are in the Assembly, to do a massive giveaway to unions who now really control the state of New York. But the real purpose, I think, of the governor calling the session tomorrow, sure, I mean, he wants to avoid chaos in New York City, but he wants to get the Tappan Zee Bridge named for his father, right? We don't hear too much about that the last couple of days, except on this show and a scattering of some other places. Where are the polls answering the question, do the people of New York want the bridge to be named for Mario Cuomo? None at all. Where are the editorials weighing in, editorials that are often quick to weigh in on the side of the governor? On that note, though, I would give uh, credit this morning to the Buffalo News for an editorial, which I tweeted out at least raising the question that you hardly see raised anywhere of what the heck is going on with Cuomo sending hundreds of New York State troopers to New York City at a time of such dire concern over the drug plague and so many other things in upstate communities. It's obviously political. It's aimed at Mayor de Blasio. Everybody knows it. Nobody does anything about it. I mean, it's just incredible in some ways. The assumption that if you inform the public, the public will respond is a fallacious assumption now in New York. It really, sadly, isn't true. And by the way, just related to what I was talking about, there's a story that I also tweeted a link out to from from uh, either a Buffalo or Niagara Falls TV station. Get this, noting that um, babies born in Niagara County now are the most likely of babies born in any county in the state to be drug addicted. Can you imagine that? I mean, Buffalo has the second highest level of child poverty in the United States for a city. The neighboring county in Niagara, this massive number, a relatively large number, of drug-addicted infants. We've got thousands of New Yorkers dying every year now, thousands, from heroin, fentanyl, and the drug scourge. And Cuomo is sending hundreds of state troopers to New York City to hang around Penn Station and Grand Central Station or wherever else he's put them in order to take on Mayor de Blasio. I mean, you couldn't make this stuff up. And what's the response out there? Silence. Every one of those Senate Republicans voted for the Tappan Zee Bridge uh, renaming. It was only the Assembly Democrats that so far have stopped it. You hear a single upstate Republican talking about these troopers being sent to New York City. Where are they? To disco. I mean, you know who they all are. You know, Jim, Jimmy Tedisco, who's going to be the great reformer? Yeah, great reformer. Marshone, Amador, Betty Little, Neil Breslin. Does he say anything about anything ever? Again, you know, it's like beating your head against the wall. Here's a kind of funny thing because it comes from a Democrat. Uh, one of these um, sanctimonious Democrats who people I'm sure have heard on my show at times. Uh, let me just find it here. Mike Gianaris from Queens, he's the guy who's always claiming that the Republicans have a war on women until there were more Republican women in the state Senate than there were Democratic women, and then he shut up about that. But he just put out a statement, headline, 
Gian Harris launches petition demanding Governor Cuomo and the state legislature address the MTA crisis. Now, keeping in mind that Cuomo has been office, in office, this is his seventh year, seven years in office, Gian Harris, quote, New Yorkers are suffering the consequences of years of underfunding and mismanagement of our mass transit system, close quote. Well, thank you, Senator Gianaris, for being candid for a change. By the way, the governor, Andrew Cuomo, controls the mass transit system. And when he talks about our mass transit system, he's not talking about the CDTA like many of these New York politicians. He's talking about, he's always New York City specific. That's one of the reasons upstate has gotten as screwed as badly as it has. They do not care about what's happened to upstate New York, these politicians from New York City. They're completely city-focused. They have no idea, or if they hear some things about it, they may laugh about what's, say, going on in downtown, uh, or the downtown Schenectady these days, the neighborhoods of Schenectady, or Arbor Hill or the south end of, of uh, Albany, or so many other communities throughout upstate New York, the urban areas, sick and dying, the rural areas depopulated, as we've talked about many, many times here. It's going to be an interesting little session to see, really, the only interesting thing. They've got to do some kind of an extension on mayoral control, if only because de Blasio, Mayor de Blasio, is going to get easily reelected, and the governor doesn't want to be blamed for the chaos down there. But what are they going to do about the Tappan Zee Bridge? I mean, we know where the Republicans are in Andrew Cuomo's pocket, but the Assembly... Uh, Democrats have some other considerations to make. I've heard it from others. I mean, it's well known. Mario Cuomo, he cost David Dinkins, the first African-American mayor of New York City, the mayor's position and elected Rudy Giuliani. I mean, why did Giuliani endorse Cuomo the year after he was elected? It was partly to pay back for what Cuomo, I had talked about this yesterday, had done for him. Andrew Cuomo, he defeated, arguably, Carl McCall, who could have been the first African-American governor of New York back in 2002 when he ran that slipshod uh, primary against uh, Carl McCall and cost McCall virtually all of his money and damaged McCall's campaign. Now, the Democratic leadership in the Assembly is dominated by African-Americans. The Speaker, Carl Hastie's African-American. Don't doubt that he doesn't know this history. He may have other considerations to take into account, but I think many of his members and many of the people that they're in contact with, to say the least, are no fans of Mario Cuomo and we would be very reluctant to name a bridge that Mario Cuomo had named for another governor, Malcolm Wilson, after Mario Cuomo. Let's go to the phones right now. We're very, very pleased to have with us a U.S. congressman from the 19th Congressional District, representing a lot of the Capital District. He's also a favorite these days of Governor Cuomo. He's John Faso of Kinderhook. Good morning, Congressman. Thanks so much for being with us. Good morning, Fred. Nice to be with you. Great to have you. You're coming here to advocate for the Faso Collins tax. Is that, the, is that correct? <laughs> uh, what, I'm, what I'm advocating <laughs> for is that New York finally uh, give our property taxpayers and commercial uh, property owners a break and start treating our people the way people in most of the 49 other states are treated, which is not having the state impose state-level Medicaid costs on local property taxpayers. And it's really a, not a complicated uh, analysis. We would give the state two and a half years to plan for this, and I think it's well within the state's capacity uh, to uh, afford this. But it's also something that's long overdue. The two things people say to me over and over again in upstate New York is that there are no jobs and I'm being forced out of state by high property taxes. And that's what we're trying to address here. You know, a few years ago, Rob Astorino carried most of the upstate counties. If you look at last fall's vote, Donald Trump carried most of the upstate counties. In fact, if you succeed in what you're trying to do, this would be a great benefit to so many upstate counties, yet they're not Andrew Cuomo's and the Democrats' counties. Do you think that's principally what's behind the governor's resistance to what could be this wonderful windfall, wonderful benefit for so many upstate residents? Well, it's, it's hard to speculate on what his motivations are. I think uh, at its core, uh, the governor doesn't want to be uh, told that he has to do something. And uh, what I'm responding to is this... 50-year-old mistake that Nelson Rockefeller first started that right. has been changed a bit through the years. The county share, the property taxpayer share has been lessened. 
But it's never been eliminated. And you know what, Fred? It never will be eliminated unless Albany is forced to do it. And uh, I read the federal Medicaid statute, and I realized that we could require Albany to do this, and that's what we've gotten in both of the Senate and the House health care bills. You know, we're still a ways from knowing, number one, whether any health care legislation is going to pass. Uh, and number two, there's always a, a risk of a, a parliamentary objection in the Senate. But the fact is we've, we've focused attention on what is a clear and present issue for people in upstate New York and Long Island, Westchester, those areas of the state outside of New York City, which is the state shifting uh, a portion of its re- its required uh, cost on Medicaid, shifting a portion of it to someone else. And this is like taxation without representation. And that's why we need to change it. I'm told that the governor, I'm told on the inside, uh, Congressman, the governor is frantic over your proposal, very unhappy about it because he figures and feels that if it succeeds, he'll get no credit. Republicans will get all the credit for one of the best things that ever happened to residents of upstate New York. What do you make of the intensity of the Cuomo attack on Faso Collins' tax, singling out you, singling out Chris Collins, and saying he's going to war against Republican Congress members in New York? I think it's really unfortunate. And the other part of this is that, look, we have, we're not going to agree on all issues, but the governor of the state uh, should be working with members of Congress from our state to try to advance the interests of New York down here. And we have a lot of issues on tax reform, on infrastructure, and it's unfortunate that he has chosen to, in in extraordinarily uh, foolish and uh, uh, hyperbolic language, uh, to indulge in these personal attacks. I, I don't do that. I definitely try to stay away from those kind of things. I'm arguing this on a policy basis. The same level of government that confers the benefit, namely Medicaid eligibility and program benefits and the range of costs that are associated with Medicaid, that same level of government should be the one that has to go to its taxpayers and say, here's why we need to raise the money from you to pay that bill. What the state is able to do is they're able to shift part of that responsibility off to someone else, and uh, that's that's what's so wrong about what the state has done for 50 years. Under, under both Republican and Democratic governors. So I'm not – to me, this is not a Democrat-Republican political issue, Fred. To me, this is a matter of life or death uh, for upstate New York. Every single county in my district and most of the counties in upstate New York continue to hemorrhage jobs and people. They're leaving, and they're leaving because of the unfavorable job climate and the unfavorable tax climate. And that's what I'm trying to address here, and I think – uh, there's plenty of waste. There's plenty of excess expenditure in the Medicaid system itself. Uh, a lot of these hidden secret deals that are masked under different uh, names, work, workforce training and workforce readjustment, all of these, these things are... where we spend hundreds of millions of dollars a year uh, through the Medicaid system or through the HICRA, the so-called Health Care Reform Act, if there ever was a misnomer, that one is, George where the Pataki's. state you know, spends about $4 billion dollars through that system, mostly uh, uh, without a lot of transparency. And uh, there's a lot of waste in the state budget, a lot of expenditures in that state budget that are less pressing than health care. And frankly, we, we should be reforming the system. Fred, it's not, a, it's not a good thing when about a third of our state's population is on the Medicaid system. Of Governor Cuomo views that as an accomplishment. I view that as a failure. We should be trying to get people off of being dependent upon the government and well, hold people on. Let me, into let me better Let in if I could, uh, Congressman. You know, the principal beneficiary of what you're describing is 1199, the Hospital Workers Union, which is a mess of political power in New York. They're running ads now attacking you, attacking Chris Collins, uh, Lisa Stefanik, and others. In a way, they're taking public monies that they've benefited from, HICRA and other things, and using them now to try to stop this kind of a change. What do you make of the 1199 attacks on you and other Republicans? Well, it's to be expected. They are basically an arm of the far-left progressive wing of the Democratic Party, and I don't think they'll be satisfied until everyone is basically uh, a ward of the state. I mean, they're literally, you're not going to get prosperity in our state when uh, you create an over-reliance upon government. And in the Medicaid system, it's primarily designed for people who are disabled, people who are seniors, elderly in nursing homes, people who are very poor, people who can't fend for themselves, like children. That's, 
That's what the Medicaid system should be designed for and what it should be. And yet the state is making this into a not a last resort, but a first resort for many people in our state. And there's no doubt that many people are in need. Many people uh, certainly we should try to address that. But, Fred, just look at the totality of what New York spends. Our state, with 19 million people, our Medicaid system spends more than Texas and California, combi- Texas and Florida combined. Those two, is two states have more than 40 million people. It's about 43 million people live in those two states. Our Medicaid system spends more than those two states combined. And people say, oh, there's nothing we could change. Every single dollar in the Medicaid system is sacrosanct. It can't possibly be reformed or adjusted. And that is simply bull, Frank, uh, Fred. It is just simply not true, uh, and it's something that Albany needs to fix. And Governor Cuomo should just do what most of the 49 other governors in the country do, which is to take control of the Medicaid system. Congressman, give, give us an update, if you would, on, on the critical question now, whether or not the Senate version of the health care bill that's out there now is likely to pass. And I would just note that the Wall Street Journal today has, I think, a terrific editorial, not only pointing out all the benefits from Republican efforts to reform the health care system, but also noting how uh, much of a watershed this vote is going to be. This could make or break not only Donald Trump's presidency, but Republican control of the Congress. What do you think is going to happen? How close will the vote be? The answer is I don't know, Fred. I know it will be close, and uh, I think Mitch McConnell is certainly uh, uh, someone who's a master tactician. If anyone can get the bill adopted and come up with the changes that are needed to get the votes, he can. But look, look at the bigger picture here, Fred. Our country is $19 trillion in debt. That's a, that is $19,000 billion. That's what $19 trillion is. We are headed to be $29 trillion in debt in 10 years. One of the keys to changing this paradigm is to slow the growth of Medicaid spending. And when you hear all these people say Medicaid is being cut $800 billion over 10 years, in actuality, Medicaid is – we are slowing the growth of Medicaid. Every single state, including New York, will get more money each year under the Medicaid proposals in both the House and the Senate. The issue is the, we, we would not be spending as much as had been promised through the ACA. Frankly, Fred, the promises of the ACA are not affordable because of those debt numbers that I just cited to you. We are really running a risk of a financial catastrophe in the United States unless we get our fiscal house in order. And I can tell you, Fred, if we have a financial catastrophe in the United States, a sovereign debt crisis, who's going to be hurt the most, the poor and the middle class? Those are the people, particularly the poor, who will be most hurt by a financial crisis in the United States. And this is staring at us. It's like the Titanic uh, looking at that iceberg uh, in the in the distance, and it's getting closer every day, and we've got to address this. And that's that's frankly why I, what I think is the most solemn obligation that I have as a member of Congress to, to raise the warning flag and to try to avert this financial crisis, which is going to hurt every single American. Just quickly, what do you make of this CBO, which in a way seems out of control, this, this figure of 22 million people losing health care? I mean, it's a misleading number, but this is the uh, arm of uh, Congress that's supposed to be uh, at least uh, indep- you know, politically yeah. independent. What do, you make, what do you tell people about that number? Well, number one, I don't believe that number. Um, a couple of things in their number are just fatuous. Number one, um, they're counting as people losing insurance, people that are now paying the fine and the penalty to not buy insurance. Who, who don't How even can have we it? count right. those people, those over 5 million people, as losing something which they're now paying a penalty to avoid? The second thing is that CBO's numbers, when they passed the ACA, they projected at this time that there'd be 23 million people enrolled through the exchanges. There are fewer than 10 million people enrolled in the exchanges today. And remember also, for, the, for my friends on the left that, uh, that are now bowing at the, before the altar of the CBO, remember when they passed the ACA, they had 10 years of revenue and only six years of expenditure in the projection. And CBO winked at that. And the left winked at that and said it didn't matter. Well, the ACA is costing a heck of a lot more than than people assumed, and this is one of the problems. So, look, I respect the CBO, but they are not gospel in my in my mind. Right. We're talking to Congressman 
Uh, John Fassett, of course. Uh, how do you feel about what is it up to number nine now? Democrats who claim they're going to run against you next year. You got quite a list there. I'll let the other side worry about that. I'm I'm not focused on the next election. I'm focused on trying to get the right policies done for the people of our country and the people of upstate New York. And one of the right policies is finally forcing Albany to abandon this calamitous policy of imposing on the property taxpayers state Medicaid costs that in virtually every other state are paid by the state. And that's how it was set up, and that's how it should be. Only New York went to this extent uh, and is totally stiffing arm, stiff-arming the local property taxpayers uh, outside of New York City, and that's why we've got to change it. But just in, in all kind of political candor, are you feeling some nervousness? Do you get a sense that your colleagues, Republican colleagues, are feeling nervousness from the tremendous pushback that the Democrats have been able to mobilize? Uh, no. In fact, I think most of us feel let, let's bring that battle on because – uh, they basically are saying they want to continue the status quo, which is leading to the decimation and depopulation of upstate New York. Yeah. We have got to change the status quo. And, Fred, I'm doing this responsibly. I'm saying as of 2020, two and a half years from now, the state would have to assume this burden, which it rightfully should have been assuming right from the get-go. Just um, getting in. And several people are very interested in what you have to say. Let me just see what this guy is saying. John Faso should... Look at the millions of New York workers who have no employer-provided health insurance. Many of these people cannot barely pay for food, transportation, ha housing. Kellyanne Conway p said people should just get jobs with health insurance. That is a great idea, but is it realistic for many workers? Asks, well, uh, you know, saying? Fred, that's a, that's a good comment, and that's one of the things in both of these uh, plans. Uh, there are created advanced refundable tax credits that is a direct subsidy to people who don't have employer-provided health insurance. Right now, the yeah. tax code gives a tax subsidy to people that have an employer-provided health policy. That's 165 million Americans. Uh, that, that benefit is not taxable to them. But if you work for an employer that doesn't provide health insurance, you get nothing in the tax code. The ACA attempted to address that, but they over-federalized the health system by the subsidies they created and uh, by the mandates, which have yeah. raised premiums and deductibles. So we're trying to give people the ability to purchase health insurance with a direct tax subsidy uh, if they don't have employer-provided health insurance. Now, some can argue, well, it's not large enough. Well, that's a, that's a fair debate to have, uh, but we've got to address this issue, and, and both the House and the Senate bills do address the issue by creating, a, uh, for the first time ever, a direct ability and a subsidy for people to buy health insurance uh, with a subsidy through the tax code. Finally, as a New Yorker, New York congressman, former assembly minority leader, a guy whose district is very close to the area, what do you think about the possibility or the maybe the likelihood of renaming the Malcolm Wilson Tappan Zee Bridge, the Mario M. Cuomo Tappan Zee Bridge? Well, I, 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 I don't know that this was given a lot of thought, but I, I would say that, uh, you know, Mario Cuomo was a very interesting and uh, uh, accomplished person. I didn't agree with a lot of his policies, and uh, I think some fitting memorial in, in memory of his tenure is appropriate, whether it's the Tappan Zee Bridge and changing Governor Wilson's name. Well, I'm not too keen on that, frankly, but I'll, that's an issue for the state to decide, not for me. So if you were in the Assembly, how would you vote? I would not vote in favor of that bill. All right. Fair enough. Congressman, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Always great to have you with us. Thank you so much. Take care. Con Congressman John Fasso, who's not running away from the issue, that's for sure, very articulate, and he's always been known as a very substantive guy. Lots of facts, lots of information, and I think he shows that when he's interviewed, so I think he serves himself well to uh, expose himself to the media, unlike a lot of politicians out there who run and hide. This is Fred Dicker. We're focused on the state capitalist. Time for the news. When we come back, state GOP Chairman Ed Cox. Now.